an ongoing controversy about the relationship between ideas and events. Some people say that it's the events of history that provoke new ideas, where others insist that it's new ideas that change the course of history. Well, I think this is one of those false dilemmas, uh, sort of like the chicken and the egg, because I think we can understand that there is a symbiotic relationship between events and ideas, where events can provoke new ideas, and new ideas can certainly shape future events. One thing I think we can be sure of, and that is that ideas have consequences. And I think it would be a, a fascinating study to look at the culture in which we live today, or to look at the history of the world in the last 2,000 years and trace the impact of the ideas of Aristotle down to the present day. Because certainly we are still living in an atmosphere where we are living out some of the consequences of his ideas. Now in theology, Luther, when he referred to John Calvin, he simply referred to Calvin as the theologian. He, obviously, there were many theologians in the 16th century, but when Luther spoke of the theologian, everybody knew of whom he was speaking, namely of Calvin. Likewise, in the jargon of philosophers in Western history, when they simply speak of the philosopher, it's obvious who they have in mind. It is the philosopher Aristotle. Now, we know that Aristotle was a pupil and disciple of Plato. He was the Academy's most illustrious alumnus. But Plato didn't refer to Aristotle simply by calling him the philosopher. Rather, Plato's pet name for Aristotle was the brain. Now, Aristotle had a profound love and virtual hero worship of his teacher, Plato. And Plato obviously had some affection for Aristotle, but the historians will agree that the degree of affection that uh, Aristotle had for Plato was not returned in kind by Plato to his student. And one of the sad notes of that relationship was that when it came time for Plato to choose a successor for himself in the academy, on two occasions he passed over Aristotle. And that very much hurt Aristotle, so that Aristotle left the academy and went out and started his own school called the Lyceum, which was what he called the peripatetic school because his method of teaching was to walk around as he was lecturing, hence the word peripatetic. Also, Aristotle was a bibliophile. That's not an illegal crime or anything like that. That just means somebody who loves books. And he possessed many books and spent a lot of time reading books. And Plato didn't give his full approval to that. Plato thought that people could become too bookish. He favored the interchange of live dialogue and discussion as his mentor, uh, Socrates, had instructed him. Plato was also known for his uh, plain style of dressing, somewhat casual, whereas Aristotle became known as a dandy. He had very expensive haircuts, and he was adorned with, uh, with uh, fine jewelry and he liked to have tailor-made uh, robes in which to dress. And so they had a little bit of conflict at that level as well. But the big point of debate between Plato and Aristotle, which has defined the difference of Platonism and Aristotelianism ever since, was over Plato's theory of ideas and consequently over Plato's theory of recollection. So, I mean, when two philosophers disagree fundamentally at the level of metaphysics and at the level of epistemology, that's a pretty significant uh, disagreement. The problem that vexed 
Aristotle in the thinking of Plato was the problem of dualism. Plato had sought to bring a synthesis or harmony between the thinking of Parmenides and Heraclitus to resolve this tension between the concepts of being and becoming, as I've pointed out. And the way he solved the problem was to speak of two different worlds, the ideal world and the world of the receptacle, the realm of being and the realm of becoming. As I said, his theme song may have been the song that was popular earlier in this century that was called Two Different Worlds. We live in two different worlds. You maybe remember that. Some of you do. You do. But in any case, that vexed Aristotle because he didn't see this as really escaping the problem of dualism. And Aristotle had a singular passion for unity. He had a deep desire to have a unified theory of knowledge that would incorporate all of the different sciences, biology and physics and astronomy and ethics and aesthetics and all the rest. And by unifying them without any kind of leftover dualism. And we may add, just as a point of historical interest, that Aristotle also had some students, as Plato had, and his most famous student was a man by the name of Alexander the Great. Well, of course, Alexander the Great is not known to the world as a philosopher in the tradition of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but rather we think of him as one of the most important conquerors of antiquity. But what motivated Alexander the Great in his uh, uh, conquest was to bring a unified culture to the ancient world. That we call the process of Hellenization. He wanted to impose the greatness of Greek culture, including the Greek language, on all of the people whom he conquered. And it, as, as uh, I've mentioned in the past, when he set out on his world conquest, he took with him a whole what would be a division of soldiers who were scientists, who were there along with the rest of the soldiers for the specific purpose of gathering flora and fauna to be classified back in the school of the Lyceum under the direction of Aristotle to advance the cause of science. In fact, it's been said that the most expensive scientific expedition in all of world history up to the NASA space exploration program in modern America was the military expeditions of Alexander the Great. But I mention that only in passing to say here is one of those cases where ideas have consequences, where the idea of unity that drove Aristotle was incorporated in the military strategies of Alexander. So he lived out the philosophical ideal. That's only one of many, many uh, modern results of the thinking of Aristotle. Well, in addressing the problem of dualism and trying to bring everything into unity, Aristotle developed what we call his theory of substance. Plato had his theory of ideas, Aristotle had his theory of substance. And what uh, Aristotle meant by this is that all individual entities, everything that exists in this world, exists as a primary substance. Now, he said two very important things about these individual entities. Remember, the concrete entities that we find in this world, according to Plato, were called receptacles. They were imperfect copies of the real ideas that exist in this other world, in the ideal world. For Aristotle, the individual objects and entities and things that we encounter in this world are real and they are substantial and that every substance is comprised of two 
aspects or two things, matter and form. Sometimes Aristotle's philosophy is referred to as the theory of form. And I would say that there's no element of Aristotle's thought that has been more perplexing to later philosophers who have sought to analyze and understand the depths of his thinking than his concept of form. And I'll just mention in passing that even to this day, there's an ongoing debate among experts in Aristotelian philosophy about exactly what Aristotle meant by his concept of form. But in this idea of substance that he distinguishes between matter and form, he finds the resolution of the ancient problem of being and becoming. In being and becoming. Now remember in Plato, being is found in the idea up here and becoming in the receptacle or material things down here. For Aristotle, being and becoming are found in each individual entity. Every substance that there is contains within it both matter and form. Form is that which gives the object or the subject its being. Without participating in being, without containing being, whatever is couldn't be, so that you couldn't have any real things or real objects unless there was some being within them. But also things in this world, physical things, material things as we know them, also have elements of change, elements of becoming. And that is part of the matter of a thing. Now let me see if I can illustrate this in our own contemporary ways of thinking. We talk, as Christians, about a human person as being made up of two distinct substances, or what we call a substantial dichotomy, a duality, not a dualism, but a duality of body and soul. And if you don't have a body, okay, then something is lost from your entity, and if you have no soul, you couldn't live at all. And so, for Aristotle, within each object, there was matter and form. And the form is the eternal uh, being, and the matter is that which is changing and is the, uh, the, the locus of potential. Now, let's talk about those terms. The other language that Aristotle was fond of using was the language of actuality and potentiality. Anything that is in a state of becoming is experiencing potential or potentiality. It is changing. It is moving from one state to another. And insofar as it is moving, it is actualizing part of its potential. But actuality is a characteristic of form or of being. Now again, let me illustrate this in simple terms. Have you ever wondered why it is when you plant an acorn in the ground, that what germinates and sprouts up from that acorn is an oak tree and not an elephant. Or when two people mate and one is inseminated by the other, why is it that the offspring of this union is not a grasshopper? Why do things produce after their kind? That was a question that Aristotle was asking. And so he would say 
that the form of humanness is contained within every person, and the form of elephantness is contained within every elephant, and the form of oak tree-ness is contained within every acorn. There is this inner being, what he called an entelechy, you don't need to remember that technical term, that is what moves or directs the particular object to actualize its potential. An acorn is actually an acorn, but potentially an oak tree. And that which determines its potentiality is the form that is found within the acorn. It has the form of oak tree-ness. The human seed has the form of humanness, and that's why we produce other human beings and not elephants. Now, when it comes to, uh, to this theory, of course, it is uh, important also to see that Aristotle makes another distinction about substance, and it's this. He makes a distinction between what he calls substance and accidents. Accidents. Not accidents, which are unfortunate mishaps, but accidents. Now, he's saying that every physical object has substance which in turn has matter and form, okay, and accidents, which I'm going to illustrate by these little lines. The accidents are the external perceivable qualities of an object. The accidents of this substance, which we call chalk, include whiteness, cylindricalness, hardness, flakiness, and so on. When you look at a piece of chalk, those are the things that you notice or see. You can't penetrate with the naked eye into the molecular structure of this chalk, or even less are you able to perceive its atomic makeup or subatomic makeup. You don't see the metaphysical substance of the thing, you say, see merely its accidents, the external perceivable qualities. Ideas have consequences. Every day, somewhere in the world, a priest is celebrating the Mass. And in the Roman Catholic Church, the Church believes that in the miracle of the Mass, the miracle of transubstantiation takes place. And how does the Church define transubstantiation but the change or transformation of substance? When they start the Mass, you have bread and wine, ordinary earthly substances. And that bread has the substance of breadness, and the accidents of bread. It looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it feels like bread, because it is bread. And likewise with the wine. It looks like wine, tastes like wine, feels like wine, sounds like wine if you spill it on the floor, because it is wine. It has the substance of wine, therefore it has the accidents of wine. But the miracle is this. It's a double miracle. In the miracle of the Mass, through the prayer of consecration, Rome defines the, the miracle as this, that in transubstantiation, the substance of the bread is changed into the substance of the body of Christ, while the accidents of bread remain. And the substance of the wine is changed into the substance of the blood of Christ, but the accidents of wine remain. In other words, it still looks like bread and wine, tastes like bread and wine, sounds like bread and wine, and all the rest. But it really is no longer bread and wine because the substance of it, its real stuff, has been changed into the substance of the body and blood of Christ. 
so that you have the substance of one thing and the, without its accidents and the accidents of another thing without its substance. You have the substance of the body and blood of Christ, but you can't see them. So you have the substance of Christ without the accidents of Christ, and you have the accidents of bread and wine without the substance of bread and wine. That's why I said it's a double miracle. Now, of course, Aristotle believed and it would take a miracle to do that because he believed in the nature of things, that all substances always are co-present with their accidents. And where you see the accidents of something, you can be sure that it has the substance of that same thing underneath it. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that is, if it has the accidents of duckness, you can be sure it has the substance of duckness as well. But I only mention that in passing to show you one way in which Aristotle's thinking is still impacting the world every single day. In fact, in 1965, the Roman Church had a crisis because on the one hand of the Dutch Catechism and the second of the writings of a Dutch theologian who challenged the formula of transubstantiation and wanted to change it to transsignification, which ultimately resulted in a papal encyclical of 1965 by Paul VI entitled Mysterium Fide in which he said, not only does the church maintain the ancient concept of transubstantiation, but insists upon retaining the formula, which formula was Aristotelian in its, uh, in its uh, uh, articulation. So this idea of substance philosophy and the distinction between substance and accidents has had a long-standing impact on the history of, ide of ideas. Now, so far we've talked about substance having form and matter. For Aristotle, it would be impossible for pure matter to exist in and of itself, because it would be pure becoming. It would be pure potentiality. It would be potentially everything, but actually nothing. So you can't have pure independent matter. But for Aristotle, it is possible to have pure form, which would be pure being or pure actuality. And when we reach that point in his thinking, we come face to face with Aristotle's creative and innovative concept of God as pure form which we'll look at in our next session.